Uh, so we're going to go, uh, I have 25 minutes and I'm going to stay within my 25 minutes. Um, I want to talk about three things. One is this increasingly complex world that we're operating in. The second is around the growing vaccine preventable disease uh, crises. And the third is around what those opportunities are uh, in the wake of this uh, crisis. So I first want to situate us in this context, which um, we've all lived, but seeing it on the on the screen is good. This is, uh, of course, the you know the the context of COVID, um, the cases that have occurred uh, when we declared a public health emergency of international concern on January 30th of 2020, and then when we uh, uh, stood that down, that the global crisis part is over. But of course, we're still living with COVID. And the reason that I mention that is that part of the reason that we're now out of the global crisis period is because of vaccines. And during this period from 2020 through the beginning of 2023, there have been 5.5 billion people who have been vaccinated against COVID. The vast majority are adults, reflecting a little over 13 billion doses of vaccine that got deployed. And during this same period, there were over 50 million children who did not get their third dose of DTP3, which then reflects all other vaccines. So this system that deployed 13.3 billion doses of vaccine was unable to vaccinate this missing 50 million kids. And so I think we have a special imperative to act on returning the immunization program, not just to its performance before 2019, but to getting it to a performance level where every child is vaccinated, every adolescent, every adult, every uh, older adult. So some people talk about this as the crisis within the crisis or the messy middle period we're in right now or a mountain beyond a mountain or the ripple effect. I just call it the new next. And I secondly want to um, sort of situate us about the vaccine program. In 1974, and if you're paying attention to the calendar, that means next year is the 50th anniversary of the EPI program founded in 1974 at the World Health Assembly. Um, in, 20, in the year 2000, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, was launched and was supporting six antigens. Um, and now if you dial forward to 2023, there are 19 antigens in Gavi-supported uh, 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 programs. So we've seen this huge increase in the scope of vaccine programs. But if you look at DTP3 coverage, which is mapped here, in the past decade, we've had a plateauing. And so if we uh, look specifically at 2021, which is the last year for which we have systematic data on coverage, and we will be releasing this year's WUNIC data, which is the WHO and UNICEF combined effort to estimate coverage for every country around the world, we will be releasing the 2022 data on the 18th of July. But here we have the 2021 data. And you can see in um, 2019, 2020, 2021, that there was a backsliding in immunization as a result of the pandemic. This meant that in 2021 alone, there were 25 million children who were un or under vaccinated. That's 2 million more than in 2020 and 6 million more than in 2019. So cumulatively, there were 48 million children in those three years who didn't even get a single dose of vaccine through the routine immunization program. Now, HPV was one of the hardest hit vaccines. And HPV, along with measles vaccine, are the two vaccines that as we move forward, by, based on modeling, have the biggest potential for reducing deaths uh, uh, as we improve programs. And here you can see the coverage of females and males We'll just pay attention to females, obviously, protection against cervical cancer. And you can see the nosedive that the HPV program took from 2019, a high of 20% coverage around the world. That's 100 countries that had introduced HPV vaccine. But because large countries were left out and the program was um, still ramping up in terms of coverage, still only reaching global coverage of 20%. And then in 2021, it was down by down to 15%, losing a quarter of its performance. Um, so really urgent action is needed to improve the HPV coverage and introduce HPV vaccine and catch up lost ground. So the pandemic really was a crisis among many other crises. And here you see 
just a set of headlines about, you know, earthquakes in Syria and Turkey, the Ukraine-Russian war, the Horn of Africa drought, um, the Sudan uh, uh, war that's going on, uh, climate change and annual temperature anomalies, um, flooding, Pakistan flooding in particular, that was historic, and almost 90 million people worldwide forcibly displaced at the end of 2021. So many, many crises going on around the world. So that's this quite complex world that we find ourselves in on the 18th of May, 2023. So what about the vaccine preventable diseases and the crises that we are sort of staring down uh, at, at this point? So measles, which um, Anne Lindstrom will talk about uh, this afternoon, I'll just show two slides on measles. It's the canary in the coal mine because of how transmissible it is. For every case of measles um, that exposes a non-immune person, there are about 12 to 18, sometimes some estimates going up to 20 or 25 additional cases. And you see the same figure here of coverage of um, first dose measles in the bar charts with the red line being first dose measles, the orange line being second dose of measles over time. And you can see during the pandemic, there was also a 5% loss of measles coverage in first dose measles vaccine, taking us backwards to a period of 20, uh, 2008. And so this means that in 2021, there were five, 25 million kids who didn't get their first dose of measles. That's on top of that, our 15 million more kids who did get their first dose, but they didn't get their second dose of measles. And so the supplementary immunization activities, which do include planned campaigns, continue to be required. And the reason that we focus on that is this map, which shows the incidence of measles cases per million in the heat map of the globe. And laid on top of that are the countries in the past 12 months that have had large and disruptive measles outbreaks. There are more measles outbreaks than these, but these are just the ones that are large and disruptive. And this is a scaling, an increase in the number of countries compared with the preceding 12-month period. So as we predicted, there is now the, the, the outcome of this backsliding in immunization coverage um, that, that occurred during the pandemic. So there's an imperative to act. Measles is not the only vaccine. Yellow fever vaccine coverage also stagnated during this period. And we have now 15 countries reporting confirmed or probable yellow fever cases and these outbreaks signal immunity gaps in high-risk countries. So there, these outbreaks are also of high concern because of the risk for urban transmission and the potential for exportation. Cholera is a third outbreak pathogen that is vaccine preventable. We're hearing about cholera outbreaks around the world. More than 30 countries now affected. Some of them are reaffected after years and sometimes decades without cholera. These are larger and deadlier than they've been, and they're occurring simultaneously with other outbreaks. On the right-hand side, you see the oral cholera vaccine doses um, that have been shipped in over a period of years. Um, and what we know is that the, the supply of oral cholera vaccine is now insufficient to respond to all of these outbreaks. And so we've moved to a one-dose schedule. And polio, which has already been discussed here, um, uh, I want to point specifically to the CVDPV detections and the seven geographies that you've heard about, which are these consequential geographies. They are differentially the places in the world that are uh, that have both CVDPV outbreaks and are the source of those strains that are causing outbreaks in other parts of the world. And so we have a very um, intensive effort to focus on the subnational inequities and the way in which there are subnational areas that are differentially impactful. These are must wins. And you can see the seven geographies that make up these consequential geographies. And of course, there are zero dose children, those children who don't receive a single dose of vaccine through the routine immunization program. Um, but this is particularly impactful on the polio side. Now, those are sort of one by one by one. And this is just an example of what's also happening now. This is an example from Zambia. Um, with the COVID cases, the waves of cases occurring in the line graph, um, and then the multiple crises occurring. So first COVID, then in uh, March of 2022, polio, then measles, then cholera, and then floods. 
And so country programs are having to respond, not just to one crisis at a time, but to poly crises. So the missed communities that I've spoken about, these zero-dose children and the communities they live in, are often epicenters of outbreaks. And, as, and when they're epicenters of outbreaks and they are missed communities, they're the least capacitated to actually detect early, to constrain them, and to respond to them. And here are just a series of the pathogens. I haven't spoken about all of those pathogens. So reaching these missed communities through regular programming, through primary health care services, is really critical for global health security, including controlling uh, COVID-19. So after much study and evaluation and quantification, we've identified four typical areas or archetypes that are particularly impacted by immunization inequity. These are the remote rural settings that are particularly challenging to access because of their remote nature. Urban crowded settings, which are increasing in size and density. The reason that they have such an impact of inequity is that people in these communities are very difficult to quantify and difficult to track. Communities affected by conflict, obviously um, specific dangers or blockage of being able to access communities, especially by government services. And then fourthly, the impact of gender, which I will get to later in the talk, not the gender of the child who's being vaccinated, but all of the ways in which gender impedes uh, establishing uh, equitable access. So what does this actually look like? This is a recent set of photos from this month. Um, conflict settings, as I mentioned, are on the increase with severe consequences for essential health services. These are photos from the Darfur region of Sudan. And this was particularly, um, these are EPI clinics as well as um, primary health care clinics that have other services. And you can see the destruction and looting of the health facility, including EPI assets on the left-hand side. The vehicle here is actually an EPI vehicle. Refrigerators were looted, vaccines were destroyed and thrown away. Vaccine stockouts have now occurred at health facility level and state level. This is very hard to recover from. And so when we look at the strategy for the decade, the Immunization Agenda 2030 strategy, which establishes the vision of a world where everyone everywhere at every age fully benefits from vaccines for good health and well-being, this is only achievable um, through global equity. And I'll point directly to the vision statement, uh, which is on the left-hand side. There are three parts to the vision statement. And each of those parts of the vision statement has quantifiable targets that have been established. Three such targets for the mortality and morbidity goal, two targets for the equitable access goal, and two targets for the strengthening immunization within primary health care. And I'm pointing just to two of them. The first is, the target for the decade for the zero-dose children is for a 50% reduction in the number of zero-dose children. That's target 2.1. And that should, uh, if we're successful, both through that and through new vaccine introductions, achieve 5 million future deaths that are averted over the course of the decade. Now, there are other targets in there, but I'm going to come back to those two that I pointed to. So I mentioned just now this 50% reduction in zero-dose children over the course of the decade. And I've plotted here the number of zero-dose children in 2019 in blue, which was 13.3 million children. And the green line is the trajectory we're supposed to be on. The blue lines, the blue bars, show what actually happened in 2020 and 2021. Instead of a reduction in zero-dose children, we've had a nearly 40% increase in the number of annual zero-dose children. And so we have an, uh, established uh, uh, an ambition with all of partners on what we're calling the big catch-up. And that is to do three things, to catch up those kids who were missed, to restore immunization programs to their 2019 performance level in 2023, and to strengthen by 2025 to get back on that trajectory. And so we'll wait anxiously for the 2022 data and continue to fill in this figure um, with the ambition of returning back to this trajectory. So what are the opportunities and actions to address this? I don't want people to despair, and that's why I show this slide. Um, these are the number of doses um, that were administered in the 57 countries that are eligible for Gavi support, either through routine vaccination in light blue or in dark blue vaccine campaigns, and then in green, the COVID vaccination. 
um, in 2021. We haven't plotted 2022 in this. But you can see the massive capacity of immunization programs, even in low and middle income countries, that the the programs were able to triple their capacity in a one year period. I don't think there's any other sector that could actually do this, could scale in this dimension um, in a one year period. And we have great examples. Kenya is one of country programs that were really resilient through the course of the pandemic. What you see in these two figures is the BCG measles first dose and measles second dose plotted according to year. And you can see uh, actually an ongoing upward trajectory even into 2022. And then on the right side, um, other antigens, oral polio vaccine, pentavalent, pneumococcal vaccine with good performance through 2021, a bit of a dip in 2022. We'll see where they head in 2023. And so Kenya is a really great example of which there are many of resilient programs. And we have been tracking the doses that have been given in 2022. This is not coverage data per se. We need to wait for the WUNIC data, which does take account of surveys as well. But the orange line of the 2022 doses of DTP third dose and MCV one dose in the bottom. And you can see compared with the dotted line, which is the 2019 doses, we do see some improvements in the 72 countries that were reporting data Um, for this analysis. Now, 72 countries is not the whole world. Um, We need the 194 countries, but we do see some very positive signals. So we're focusing in the countries, which turn out to be 20 countries, that make up three quarters of the zero-dose children in 2021. And you can see the map and then the list of those countries on the right-hand side. And the colors reference the coverage in 2021, according to DTP1 coverage. So this list of countries is not all countries that have weak programs. Some countries are on this list because their coverage was less than 90%, but they're a really big country. So India is an example of that and has made very impressive uh, improvements to recover from the pandemic we know already for 2022 and 2023. And how should that recovery happen? Um, So I've mentioned already the three-pronged approach of catching up children who missed vaccine, restoring the performance of immunization programs, and strengthening the program. And the way to do that is through these six primary levers of political leadership, advocacy and partnership, resource mobilization, tailored country responses, and responsive technical assistance, which many people in this room are part of as well as monitoring and learning. So I'll go into a little bit of detail about sort of concretely, what are we talking about? The Zero Dose strategy is about identifying, reaching, and measuring and monitoring children who are Zero Dose children who live in Zero Dose communities. Um, Really, the, the tactics and the tools we have for doing each of these things have made substantial progress. So during this pandemic period, we, we as, a, as a community, we said we should never let a good crisis go to waste. And indeed, we focused on the innovations that could be scaled during COVID and then driving those into the routine immunization program. So we focused during COVID on what we knew worked. Number one, taking vaccines to people. When you make vaccines easily accessible at a time and a place where people can um, access them, immunization coverage goes up. And there were all kinds of innovations that you can see in the photos here um, that took place uh, uh, to deploy COVID vaccine that are also being now employed during the routine immunization program. Secondly, using data to guide when and where vaccines are needed. So tracking of vaccines, assuring that there are not vaccine stockouts, and monitoring coverage of vaccination so the program can adjust. And thirdly, high-level sustained political commitment which we saw all over the place um, during COVID time and trying to drive that, um, uh, continue drive on that political leadership on routine immunization. Next were the opportunities in digital health. And we have long had this ambition that we would move from paper-based systems. We would use the technologies that we have, handheld devices, um, uh, uh, real-time monitoring, use of GIS technology to drive the parts of the immunization program that could benefit. And indeed, that's exactly what happened during COVID. Um, Systems using especially DHIS2 
digital personal health records. I suspect everybody in this room has their COVID vaccine status on their phone. Um, but now using those for, for childhood immunization and, and, and beyond. And we have GIS supported micro planning and campaign real time monitoring. So we know from a monitoring perspective when and where vaccinators are, um, and, and what geography they've been covering. And then healthcare provider electronic training and decision support tools in their hands so that they can deploy vaccines and, and, um, track people who are missing their vaccines with ease. And the same is true of the digital supply chain information and social listening and infodemic management. I also really want to point to healthcare workers. We know that they are crucial for addressing coverage challenges. And yet in many, many countries, probably countries um, that you come from as well, there are really big issues with healthcare workers as vaccinators, including the use of community health volunteers as part of the core program of routine immunization and expecting volunteer time to be the time on which we ground an immunization program is really being called into question. There are increasing calls for fair pay and work conditions, and we're seeing increasing numbers of strikes of health workers, especially vaccine workers, um, in protest of, of this. So really time for governments to step up. And healthcare workers are critical for addressing vaccine hesitancy. There are many reasons why children are missed and many reasons why families don't access services when they're available. These are just three countries um, and looking at different criteria, either mistrust or fear, parents' knowledge of the value of vaccines or the availability of programs, not prioritizing vaccines or being too busy to, uh, to uh, reach those vaccine services, the distance from the facility, um, all of these are reasons, and you can see in different geographies, different reasons have uh, play an outsized um, uh, importance compared with others. And so health workers are really critical for addressing many of these. Now, I just want to point to gender as a, a particular issue. This figure is from the polio strategy, and the polio program has been particularly impactful and taken a particular leadership role in um, addressing gender. So there are many barriers um, that are gender related, literacy of women, decision making authority of women, household access, educational status, prioritization of health by the child's gender, the independence of mostly women who are taking children for vaccination, um, their ability to take transportation, the time that they need, and many other barriers. When we fail to recognize the way in which gender affects all of these we're not able to solve these. I also want to comment on climate change. If you were to imagine the world that we will have in the next 20 years and then contemplate the immunization program that we have of today, I would argue that our program is not designed for a world of climate change. So I won't be able to go into detail on this, but I do want to really celebrate the changes that are happening and the use of solar energy for refrigeration as one critical element of sustainability of our programs. This is data from Burkina Faso um, showing the source of power for the refrigeration in 2017 and in 2020. And you can see the dramatic change in the use of solar power for refrigeration. Now, this also harkens back to Barney's talk about mRNA vaccines. We would really want to have vaccines that don't require a minus 80, a minus 70, or frankly, even any cold chain. Um, but this is the world and the set of vaccines that we have for now. I also want to uh, point to the surveillance system for vaccine preventable diseases. Surveillance is a core element of a well-functioning immunization program. It's not only about outbreak detection. It's also about optimizing schedules and optimizing products. And so a comprehensive vaccine preventable disease surveillance program at the country level is a critical feature that needs to, um, needs to advance and is making great progress. And finally, other barriers that are being, uh, are being addressed. The regional distribution of vaccine manufacturing is also key for addressing inequities. And this is just one example of many efforts. This is the mRNA technology transfer hub established in South Africa with, with 15 um, other countries receiving training um, and standing up the opportunity to develop mRNA vaccines. 
And then the last example is just novel delivery devices. So I commented on the cold chain, and I do want to point out that we would all love to get away from injectable vaccines. Microarray patches are finally making headway, and especially the use case for measles and rubella microarray patches, which you see an example of on the left-hand side. There are not at this point any vaccines that are licensed on a microarray patch at this point, but clinical studies are ongoing. And yesterday was the announcement of the phase one, phase two data from Micron on the measles and rubella microarray patch. And you'll see just the little quote down here that immune responses triggered by the vaccine were similar, regardless of whether it was delivered by a patch or traditional subcutaneous injection, with more than 90% of parents whose children were enrolled in the trial said that patches were a better way to give vaccines, which will likely address some of the vaccine hesitancy. So on improving coverage and equity, the target is to have a world of full equity. And around this target, you can see all of the domains, and there are probably more that you can think of that are needed in order to advance towards that bullseye. So I'll just stop here by saying that as we think about this, what it really, really is about is that vaccines are able to protect the child that is within, the adult that's within every child, and of course, of course the, the healthy and well-being future of every adult. And I'll stop there at 26 minutes and 30 seconds. Perfect. Thanks, Kate. Thanks a lot. So we have time for questions, as Kate was right on time. Questions? Thanks, Kate. Thank you very much. I was wondering um, regarding the importance of surveillance and, and the impacts of the pandemic that was given on the routine immunizations like UNICEF and WHO already called out on board for this a long time ago. But at the same time, the WHO Emergency Commit Committee only um, ended the fake of COVID uh, very recently. So, I mean, I, I do think that this was kind of a double messaging that was not always easy for countries to understand because the fake does come with international obligations in terms of surveillance that are specific for COVID, etc. So, in hindsight, do you think the fake could have ended earlier or do you think we could have done things differently or any other lessons learned from that? Um, it's a great question. And I think um, one of the things that we've really learned in the course of this pandemic is how conflated and, um, uh, well, first of all, how critical communication is. And I think the understanding that people have of what, what does a public health emergency of international concern constitute what does it obligate countries to do? And how is that different or the same from just the word pandemic? Um, and so I think you've pointed out that when there is a public health emergency of international concern, and specifically under international health regulations, there are obligations of countries for which there is little enforcement power, but uh, certainly there is uh, the, the transparency about uh, the way in which countries are um, are conforming to the regulations that they have legally agreed to. The timing of when the fake was both stood up January 30th, which was very, very soon. You will remember that the first public information was December 31st. So within one month, we declared a public health emergency of international concern when there were still very few cases relative to where this ended up going. But the timing of when to stand it down is, is really um, an important question and there have been many opinions issued about whether it was too soon, too late, um, and many countries that had already moved on from many of the interventions that they had already done. But I think the critical thing is that a fake does afford us, as WHO, as the lead health agency of the UN, um, certain obligations and powers also um, to uh, determine the best recommendations for the interventions that countries should be taking and the sharing of those interventions across all countries. So we can certainly debate whether or not it should have happened earlier or later, but I can say that the emergency committee was contemplating this for many months and watching very carefully um, what was happening with the the nature of the of the pandemic, and especially as China was opening up in that later period um, and unclear exactly what was going to happen as a result of the surge in cases. Um, no. 
Thanks, great. Uh, for that great overview. Uh, my question relates to the zero dose children and the definition of DTP1, some of whom may have had a vaccine, i.e. the birth dose, and then there's the partially vaccinated, under vaccinated, one year of age, two years of. So I guess I'm curious what countries are finding the different implementation barriers might be or vaccine uptake barriers across those three definitions where there's actually no vaccination at all, the zero dose versus a partially vaccinated and what the differences look like across those three. Yeah, there's no perfect quantitative definition of the zero dose child. I think we all understand the concept. It's those kids who are really left out of the program altogether. Um, and because not every country has BCG in its program, it's hard to define a global metric based on an antigen that is not worldwide. However, in some countries, that may be an appropriate operational antigen to monitor as the means to achieve um, inclusion of all children in the routine immunization program. There's also been discussion that um, simply receiving the first dose of a DTP-containing vaccine doesn't preview that a child will actually get their first dose of measles vaccine. And so some people argue also that there's a concept of zero dose for measles or zero dose for HPV. And yes, of course, those are, those are accurate and real. Um, but I think what we're trying to get at with the zero dose concept is that these are, um, these are not random kids. They're not just a, your average random child who's found sort of, sort of anywhere in any community. They tend to be highly clustered. They tend to be um, children who are born into families that are left out of most primary health services and beyond even primary health services, most essential services, education, um, nutritional programs, uh, all kinds of services. They're often marginalized, either ethnically, religiously, um, socioeconomically, or um, from, a, from a status, an other status in the country, often having no status in the country, not even enumerated with a birth certificate. So I think it's the concept that we're trying to get at and the choice of which metric to choose, what definition to choose, so that at least we can do monitoring and evaluation over time across countries shouldn't impair countries or communities if there's a better definition that would drive operational activities in a program. I think it's it's perfectly welcome for for um, for programs to define this in a slightly different way. I don't think we should get into an arm wrestle about what the what the best definition is. There's been lots of engagement around, you know, uh, the pros and cons of different definitions. But I think as long as people understand it's not sufficient just to get the first dose of DTP containing vaccine, it's really the the entry point for then being able to follow up for all every other dose and every other part of the program to become fully vaccinated for every antigen that's recommended. Sophia. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you also do monitoring and evaluation of vaccine waste and uh, how to minimize. Uh, thank you. So the issue of vaccine waste is a really interesting one that I think has gotten quite um, misrepresented and misaligned. We do have policies which are not necessarily taken up in every country that a vial should be opened regardless of how many children are there to receive it. The vaccine waste um, is an inherent part of an immunization program when we're dealing with vials that are more than a single dose vial, or frankly, even for single dose vials, there will be um, some waste uh, that, that takes place. And I think this idea that health workers have that has come from past years of programs to really minimize waste because of the cost of the vaccines. Many, many vaccines are pennies a dose. Others are very expensive. As Mary pointed out, the current malaria vaccine is nine euros 30 per dose, a very expensive vaccine. But the point is that the policies are around opening a vial for any child who is there. And I think the importance is really to implement those policies. And I, I would say any any of you in the room and all of us at WHO who make country visits, this is pretty regular that when health workers will give you the right answer, and then if you um, ask in a, in a different way, they'll tell you what they really do. Um, so this is one of the big missed opportunities for vaccination is the failure to open a vial even for a single child in a single session. Pamela? 
Thank you, Pamela from Cameroon. I, I was just wondering about uh, the, the total logistics needs. We know that it changes over time, and sometimes in some countries, the stockouts have actually affected uh, the number of zero-dose children and the number of under-vaccinated children. So I just want to know what strategies are, are being taken into consideration to address this problem. Yeah, so I mentioned in one of the um, slides I had on innovations is the digital tools on stock management and supply chain are have been a real a really big game changer for countries so that stockouts where it's in the control of the country are previewed and not and, and don't happen. Now many of the stock well I shouldn't say many some of the stockouts are really outside the control of the country. For example, we've had pretty significant rotavirus vaccine stockouts because of uh, manufacturer issues and switches that countries have needed to uh, to to implement. Um, but where stockouts are in the control of the country, you're absolutely right that advancing the skill, the training, and the tools that logisticians have um, in order to um, uh, monitor the stock levels right down to the facility level, it really is about the improvement of the digital tools and the supervision taking place on um, stock management. So this is one of the big leapfrogs that also took place during COVID is the um, dissemination and implementation of many of those digital tools. But Great. Thanks so much. I wonder if we could return to zero to those children for a moment. Um, so it seems from prior experience that the most vulnerable children are the most hard to reach. And you sort of gave a number of just um, sort of articulated that so well. I'm just trying to think about what are the innovative strategies to reach those kids? And I realize it's sort of context specific, but is it is it community? Is it local public health? Is it sort of where do you put the resources to reach those kids that are going to be so hard to reach for the reasons that you said? It's really, I would put at the very center of this, community service organizations. The CSOs are the organizations that are part of these communities. They know where the kids are. They they are the the religious groups. They are the ethnic groups. They are the leaders in those communities. Um, so I would put the CSOs at the very, very heart of this. The second is I would put the community leaders um, as as part of that. They may or may not be part of a CSO, um, but the community leaders are are the critical linchpin to all of this. And then the third thing that I would say is that um, something as simple as vital registration, uh, the fact that uh, we we countries don't have an accurate denominator of who the children are, and and these children are invisible very often. Um, they're not enumerated. They're not quantified. They're not on a registry. They're not in anybody's sort of list. And so th I think this is the second area is that the immunization program is not a standalone. It's deeply linked to some of the improvements also in vital registration status um, and in the political commitment to reach every child regardless of what the status of that child is um, to be in the country. And as we preview, as we're, you know, moving forward into this new world, the projections we see of the number of children and families and people who will be in humanitarian crisis, who will be migrants, who will be climate change migrants, we really have to think carefully about what the program looks like, especially with respect to, for instance, handheld records of what somebody has already achieved. And I mentioned this before, even things like we would never design immunization programs that take multiple doses if we had our choice, right? We would have antigens for which a single dose is good, is a lifetime immunize, you know, immunizing event. So when we think of all of these different ways in which communities and zero-dose children get left out, I think these are all the elements. It's quite a long list of the ways in which we have not designed a program or the antigens to serve those who are most vulnerable to disease and will be most unable to actually um, be protected and have access. That, that's where we really have to focus. But I'll really point to the CSOs, community leaders, um, and enumeration of kids. Yeah. So I have Iya, Wahid, and then I'll move there. Thank you. So um, I have a lot of questions, but I'm just going to ask two. <laughs> so uh, the first one is you mentioned, you talked about the health workforce 
the motivation about um, the health workers. This is really uh, an issue. I'm from Guinea, by the way, which one of the highest zero dose cases, even though it's not showing there. Um, our issue is really to help the people who are responsible for providing these vaccination services. Most of them are volunteers. And you can talk about, you can talk about accountability when you, you can hold someone account, accountable if you're really not, uh, giving him or her the tools that he needs and motivating him or her well. So the question is, how is WHO really, um, because this is a national issue, how are you really pushing with governments to integrate those volunteers in the national system? in a way that there will be a sustainable system of catching up. Because the, the, the issue now is we're going to catch probably those zero doses that are currently here. But if the system is not there, there will be new bonds susceptible and there's going to be new zero doses. So this is, that's the first question. The second one is uh, the good example you presented about uh, Kenya. I would like to know what were the, um, what's the lesson that we can take? Yeah, how, did, how did they do it? Yeah. Um, yeah. So just on the, on the health workers, whether they're volunteers or paid workers. So WHO is, um, uh, strongly advocating for health workers to be, uh, paid workers, um, for their, uh, work conditions and training to be appropriate to the tasks that they're being held accountable for. Um, I'll point, uh, specifically World Health Assembly, where every minister of health will be in Geneva. Um, uh, next week, there will be a specific roundtable on the health workforce. Um, and so there are many initiatives and working with country political leaders um, to uh, uh, secure the health workforce as a, a trained, recognized, um, accountable part of a health system. That's often, obviously up to every national uh, health planning process and getting uh, people on, on budget. One of the, the, the second question around, um, uh, sorry, I just want to say one more thing about the community health workers, whether they are volunteers or paid workers. I think another attribute of this, uh, and we will be having a round table. So a round table on the health workers at lunchtime on Tuesday. And then on Friday is the, the round table on immunization. And we will have a community health, um, worker on as part of that round table. Um, really speaking, uh, 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 very uh, impactfully about not only the importance of paying community health workers, but also having community health workers as a recognized entity, a recognized specialty, if you will. They're not physicians, not nurses, but community health workers have a, a specialty of their own that is not fulfilled by uh, other parts of the health system. And they should have a seat at the table of planning programs, of planning campaigns, they generally have some of the deepest knowledge of the community and of what will work and what won't work, but are not often left out of the planning process and are, um, are, are included really as, as a sort of, uh, just an implementing, um, sector. So that's the second thing. On, on the issue of Kenya, I think, um, with limited time, first of all, Kenya had a strong program to start with. Um, it has been a heavily invested program. Um, the third thing is that during the course of the pandemic, there was very strong political decision-making and political leadership to prioritize not only the immunization program, but other essential health services. And it's ultimately that political decision-making that puts budget and puts resources um, with availability to maintain systems. And that's why in the six levers that we pointed to in the recovery effort, is political leadership is at the top. And I would, I would argue that there's probably no program that can be pointed to that has actually performed at a high level that didn't have that. Um, and although it sounds very sort of vague and unclear what that actually is, I think for those who are working at the political level, um, you recognize it when you see it. It's about where budget is placed. It's about having a line item in the budget, the national budget on vaccines and on the health workforce. It's about the training that's afforded to people, the, the work conditions, the pay for people. It's about all of those things. And it's about using data to continue to modify the program, which we've seen excellent examples of in Kenya. 
Um, and I'll just give an example from northwestern Kenya, where they've um, made a decision to go ahead and pay the community health volunteers. And, and that has, you know, had a transformative effect um, for the program.